All right. Welcome, everyone, to the beginning of our Bizapalooza chat. I am here with chief question asker, not answer, uh, right? I don't, I don't answer any of them, so I just don't ask answer them. any of them. You only ask chief question asker Patrick Hitchell, all the way out in Denmark. Yeah. So say hey, Patrick. Hi. I, you're the one. You're the one that's far away. David and I are on the other side of the pond. So uh, exactly, I am the one that Jess and I and I don't know who else is dropping in here. We Eve are. Eva's also over here. So you're outnumbered. We are outnumbered by the euros. I yeah. love it. I love it. So yeah. I want to welcome you all to our yeah. Bizapalooza chat hashtag Bizapalooza chat, where we talk with the rock stars of small business, digging deep into some mind blowing stuff. So, Patrick, you are a Microsoft guy? Mm, yes, I am. So, the first thing I got to ask you is I want you to tell me about this, what you mean by chief question asker and what you mean by ninja cat, because I think that's really going to take mm. us where we want to go. Well, I've, I'm a very... Mm, Maybe a nice way to put, put I believe in the Socratic in the, sec, the Socratic method. I believe in Socrates and his method. And I think the the ability to ask a question and form a question is much more important than actually knowing the answer. And it takes a lot more self uh, understanding and ability to understand the things around you to be able to form questions. And once you form the questions, then the answers will come uh, of themselves. So I really believe in asking questions and forming questions and helping people reflect enough to be able to form questions so they can find the answers that they're looking for. So I think asking questions is a uh, is very important part of life I and mean, I don't think people do enough of it and it takes a lot of listening I think to 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 find and form good questions. Um, mm. So I, I have to put you on the spot and I'm sorry to do it. Okay. But can you give me an example of like a really good question, maybe one that you've asked lately or one that might have ruffled some feathers or I don't know, that kind of exemplifies what you're talking about. Hey, you're putting me on the spot here. Um, I am. Well, I've spent a lot of time out at, hey, why is a great question. I think question they, uh, um, I was asking myself, the, I mean, I, I go through a lot of self analysis also. I think it's very healthy to kind of look over things uh, in retrospect and try to understand why you did the things you did or or I said the things you did. And, it, um, you know, I went to a, a bout of depression about eight years ago. And one of the questions that's been actually bothering me a lot lately with myself is I can hear myself asking myself. So once you get used to asking questions, you ask yourself a lot of questions. And, and, and I think that this is a natural part of, of life is that you should ask yourself a ton of questions, even if you don't know the answers, because the, the questions will make you seek the answers. Uh, and one of the questions that I've been asking myself is why in that time did I give up on myself so easily? Oh. And I think that th this is a this has been a, a question that's kind of been, you know, niggling the back of my brain for uh, the last couple of days it, um, is why what happened in that moment in those moments that that I allowed myself to give up on myself. Mm. Very personal question. So, um, but it's causing a lot of change within myself. So it's it's really right up for, for the for the talk. It's causing me to take inventory of my life. Um, so, yeah. So how's that I for love answer? It. I think that's an awesome answer, right? Because incorporated the basic question why. And sometimes when I get in that space, that's so appropriate for so many small business owners and entrepreneurs. But when I get in that space, there's two things that you said that really strike me. One is if I don't know the answer to something, sometimes I'll ask myself the question of how did I solve this problem? Like sort mm -hmm. of like it's brain tricks. Yeah. Right? And um, the other thing that you brought to mind is it's, it's not just what happened in your life that maybe had you feeling that way. Not just you, 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 all us. It's what did you make it mean? Mm -hmm. Which is a really powerful question. Stuff happens and you can make it mean anything you want. Yeah. Right. So speaking of making things mean whatever they want. Um, so, you know, I was, Eve and I were pulling together some of this information and I'm like, oh my God, this guy, I actually said that you guys were like entirely too deep for those of us in the gifted class. You know, we need to be talked to at like maybe the third to sixth grade level. Okay. 
Um, but as I was jumping around and I found one of your LinkedIn articles and then I saw that your title was Ninja Cat and mm. there is a whole story around Ninja Cat. Yeah. Do you know do you do do you know Ninja Cat? I don't know Ninja Cat. Okay, so I I'll I'll pop a link in a little bit about Ninja Cat. And Ninja Cat is basically like someone in Microsoft made up a cool ninja cat with a bandana sitting on a flaming a unicorn shooting fire and posted this in Reddit and he posted and they posted a bunch of other animals that Ninja Cat's been on, something to do with bacon and all kinds of crazy stuff. But it became really like cool kind of like symbolism for from Microsoft and started attracting the cool kids, right? So if you want to attract cool kids, you got to do cool stuff, right? The thing is, this unicorn, this fiery unicorn, it ended up as like a in our lobby of our building where you could take pictures of yourself with the flaming unicorn, like a, a cardboard, whatever. Oh. So I decided that I was going to take a picture with the unicorn and put the headband on and hold the Microsoft flag, and I was going to become Ninja Cat. And then as a, as a test for myself, I decided that I would change my title in LinkedIn to Ninja Cat. And I wanted to see how many likes and comments I received in a two to three day period because I changed my title in, to Ninja Cat. Um, and and this what is, did you learn? Because there's some interesting things that came up that take us to our conversation. Well, well, it's something that I knew already about LinkedIn and that it's on autopilot. So I got 800 likes and both private and, and public comments, I got around six or 700 uh, on, on this idea about being Ninja Cat. And I think it's basically a reflection of this whole discussion. This is one of the standardized platforms that we're using, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, stuff like this, where there's a bunch of automation and they've made it very easy for you to not actually read of what you're doing, but just like things. Mm -hmm. And I think that that uh, these standardized social platforms, um, you know, make it easy for you to to fakely engage with people without realizing um, what you're actually doing. This, I, I have a bunch of questions here, Patrick. I know I okay. do, I do. Okay. But Everything. I have to have this conversation with you and Blab is the best place to have it. So we're uh -huh. having half of this conversation here and this whole other changing to conversation on Twitter in a few minutes, yeah. but I want to talk about the engagement bubble. I'm so glad to see that Amy's here because she's an upstart. Yeah. This woman wreaks havoc everywhere she goes. Amy, I'm glad you're here because you got to hear what Patrick has to say about this. So perfect uh, timing for you. What's an engagement a, bubble? Okay, I did a keynote about this actually, this very subject. Someone invited me to speak and I actually wrote, a, I had an article and I created a presentation around it. So I, I can fit you the link for the entire for the entire presentation where I had go in detail about this. But the premise is, is that engagement is currency and that, uh, and that, that if it was a real currency and you treat it like real currency, we would have checks and balances that would tell us the value of this currency. And the problem is we don't have these checks and balances or we didn't have these checks and balances and people have been printing engagement through automation. And, you feel this very heavily on Twitter. You, it's also on LinkedIn, actually, and on Facebook that we have basically have a bubble of engagement or we've had a bubble of engagement on social media networks because we have, through automation, basically created engagement inflation through automation. So the, the price of the engagement currency has increased exponentially. And then I, and then I, in my world, it's basically this bubble has popped and we're feeling the the pull from this bubble uh, and it'll take us in to the next year or two. I think we really feel so it. Quite this heavily. brings my next question, right? So in, in one of your articles, you wrote about something called the law of the farm. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I do. All right. So tell everyone this, another one, people, I need to get my jacket because I'm chilled on this. Amy, need to ask, are you saying the engagement bubble has popped? I sent you the link. Uh, we can feel this engagement bubble has popped, and you can feel there's an article by Buffer where they've lost half of their referral traffic from social networks in 2015. So they lost 100,000 visits to their website in 2015 from from social traffic. And I think that that is, I don't, wouldn't call it an explosion like Mount St. Helen blowing up, but I would certainly say that the air has been coming out of this bubble in a pretty consistent manner um, in the last three to six I, months. I, I, have we'll to I have to agree. So I'll be back in one second. Because uh, what I've noticed myself 
it, it all kind of when we started blogging and then you were getting comments, right? And then that engagement shifted from the blog itself to now where very few articles get comments. The art, a conversation has shifted over into social media platforms. So whether you're on LinkedIn or Twitter, I like Twitter, so that's where I'm at. And yeah. that's where the conversation was happening. And now anybody, look at your replies. I mean, who checks direct messages anymore? Yeah. Look at your replies. It is nothing but vapid, empty garbage. Mm. The reason that LinkedIn went nuts for me is I had a I had an article that went viral. I got 50,000 views on an article in 24 hours. And then my next article got 200 views. And, and it was, I thought some type of algorithm would kind of carry these thing over to each other that I would get a knock on effect from one or the other. And that didn't happen. And then it made me really start digging heavily in and testing LinkedIn from various angles. Uh, it made me really realize that there's just no one at the, <laughs> I thought no one was at the wheel at Twitter. I don't think anybody's at the wheel at LinkedIn either. And they have actually terrible security, as we all know. So it's made me dump them as a platform, uh, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You and I had that conversation. So let's talk about, because I think this is somewhat related, right? Which is yeah. the law of the farm. You can't cram relationships is what you said. So explain that to everybody because people, this is so cool. Yeah. Well, what I do with my job is that I help, I try to help customers realize value through their technological investments. And this is really enterprise customers. The current I'm doing lots of work with large enterprise customers. And I think this whole idea about digital transformation, and I won't use the word digital anymore, but this transformation that's going on that technology is creating is forcing companies to change the way that they work. And companies have been neglecting to do this. So they've been trying to do that. They're trying to cheat. Well, they're trying to cheat their way to the result. Stephen Covey has this great thing called the law of the farm that you just can't have a magic pill and get the desired, desired results that you want to have. You actually have to work at your people, at your processes, at your technology, if you want to get the real value. So it's like being on a farm. You can't plant your seeds at on April and expect to have results by June. You have to be working at this constantly. And this is why this subject is, to me is the, the real change isn't the technology. The real change is us, the people. And it's us that are driving this change. So we need to like get away from this idea that all of a sudden technology is this huge transformational driver. It's us adopting this technology deeper and deeper into our lives and deeper and deeper into our organizations that is actually causing organizations to um, to, to change. Um, Doesn't sound so. like a good thing. You know, this reminds me, I can't believe this, you know, I was, in, you and I were about the same age. We were in, I was in college in the 80s. I'm 25. Yeah, you're 25. Excellent. Well, I'm 63. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so actually so the, the what i remember being in school when uh wasn't excel what was the other one before excel i can't lotus lotus one two three yeah. remember when loaded when spreadsheets first came out and i i took a class it mit and management information technologies it was called mit and one of the first things that professor said was if you can't do it on paper do not try to program it in. And I thought that was really, really insightful. So it speaks to this transformation and adaptation to technology, right? Because you need to know what you want to do. The technology isn't going to do the smart of it. No. Right? But that's the big thing is people think they can buy, they can buy or a, they can buy or a changing or adopting to many technologies. They think that that will give them this uh, magic matrix pill, uh, and it's just not the case. You can in, I've seen investments in technology that just go absolutely nowhere because the change mechanism is people, not the technology. So um, companies think they can just switch out technology and they'll get these great investments. And I have a saying that says, I say to people all the time, if you have a burning platform, so if you feel like this idea that your your platforms are burning in your company, it's because your your skills of your people are burning, your leadership is burning, everything else is burning, but where you feel it the most happens to be right there. Yeah. So Amy makes and, a really good comment here. She says, so you have to think this out. Technology integration is the problem, not the idea of social communication. That sort of brings me to my question, right? You know, what is the difference between gathering information and then actually 
gathering information on people, companies, industries, and actually knowing it. Is there a relationship there? I guess that depends on which angle you're looking at this from. Because if I'm a, if, if, if I'm a consumer shopping somewhere, if you take it from that angle, the best they're ever going to know about me is how many times I'm ever there and what I actually buy. Uh, so the data that they collect about me and the profile they make about me might actually, you know, uh, that might be the, that might be them knowing me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's a good thing. It gets a little spooky when they start doing intelligence on top of it, where they start figuring out stuff about my life that I don't want to tell anybody. Or you hear about the story about this teenage girl that you know was in Target or whatever, and father got some coupons to buy diapers or whatever and she's like no one's pregnant in our house but they kind of figured out from her buying habits that she was actually you know pregnant and that's where it gets kind of a little bit like all right this is where it gets a little kind a of little creepy weird. right so there is a there is a difference and the line is always moving because 10 years ago what we consider privacy is not privacy today correct and the future of privacy is really an open air discussion i personally don't think i think i for me i think that privacy is there's still a Trojan horse in privacy. I think actually we're going to pull back some of our privacy in, in the in the next five years, actually. I think people have waken up to the fact that they've given up too much and they're going to fight for this to get it back. This is what I think. This is what I hope. So just so. to be clear, I think I want to come back to Amy's point. She's saying that the problem is technology integration and not the idea of social communication. So this, I, I think what you mean, Amy, and correct me if I'm wrong, is... We always want to connect and know other people. Like, that's not going away. I mean, I would agree. Relationships are everything. And how you make these relationships. Like, I know Eva through Twitter and through Skype and whatever. So, I mean, I consider that a real relationship. I know David through Twitter and Facebook now. I consider that a, a, a real thriving relationship. I hope to sit down and have a beer with him in June. Um, so, that's, so, there's no doubt that the technology has allowed the world to become smaller and we can know a lot about each other in a much faster uh, manner, um, but um, we've also paid a price for this. Right. So exactly. that's really my point. Exactly. I think that's fantastic. So, and all you guys that are here, I know you have some val valuable inputs. What does David mean by blockchain? I'm what is that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a that's, this is a discussion for itself. But it's a it's a whole tech it's a technology. I can drop a link in about blockchain, but we could talk about blockchain forever if you like to do this. So, okay. Well, um, let me let me get through <laughs> this. Let me get through this whole thing here. Let's see. So, in what ways do you feel that being overconnected or over technologized is that a word can harm small businesses? Well, I think that why the way I would interpret this is that. This question is that I would just say that um, keep everything measurable. So we have a, in this little group that I know, David and these guys, I, I like I always thrive for ROI. And what I mean by this is I always thrive tying what you're doing, no matter where you're doing it, platform wise or wherever, tying it to some type of business outcome. I just think this is very important. And I think in the small days, in the days when you're a small business, that I think that keeping a focus on what your actual business goals are is very important and don't get lost in this idea that you have to be everywhere and all the time and that you have to have 60,000 Twitter followers or you have to, I'd much think you can find some people who you can build strong relationships with online and let them do the footwork for you. That would, that's what I would say. Uh, I'd find some good av advocates out there who can be your friend that would push your message with you through conversations through like David and, and myself and I see Josh is on here. We have a little small group in private chat on Twitter, but we share a lot of information on Twitter with each other. And then I think the conversation that we have there attracts a lot of attention from other people. And if I was a small business, I would find these people that I can build relationships with and have, have them help you push your message. I think that's and tie it to, to a business outcome. And there's so, you know, one of the things that you also talked about is this idea of being overwhelmed by technology. You know, actually that's one of the reasons a lot of follow me is because I'm a complete geek. I love all these different platforms, but at the end of the day, you've got to focus and you've got to find what works for you. How do you recommend that businesses choose their technology? You've written about this, I think. This is tough. I, 
I'm a, I'm an, I really believe ecosystem is the future. So I think that companies should just decide on a set of technologies, mm -hmm. whatever this happens to be. So let's just say they choose HubSpot or something like this, but they should, they should stick with that technology until they can absolutely measure that it can't give them anything else in return and then switch. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what a lot of companies do is they, they pick and choose and put things together without really understanding the actual benefits they can give them. So my advice to, I talked to a lot of enterprise companies, stop buying technology. You have everything you need. So it's not the technology. The focus is the farm, not the technology. So you need to pick your pick and choose your technology and you need to work these tools. This is like a toolbox. It's like a plow. It's like everything else. You got to like, you got to like massage it and use it and work it and get blisters on your fingers and rack your brain out and swim tears and cry over it. And, and then all some magic will happen. You just can't plug it in. So find a set of tools and work them to death. This is, this is what I think. Yeah, that, that, and you will see, you will see over time whether they are good enough for you in the future. You will know when the time will come to change the tires on the car because you will realize they've driven as far as they're going to take you. Um, so, oh, I think that's such great advice, right? Let's see what the comments are. We've had some fun conversation. I see Winnie is here. Winnie, I wanted you here to hear this social engagement bubble conversation. So we just had it. But this idea of uh, using technology and choosing technology is really difficult. And I'll tell you what I get stuck in, and I'm willing to bet a lot of other folks get stuck with this too. So I go out wanting to accomplish something. This is your farming example, right? I want to, yeah. I want to be able to do one thing or another. And let's say I find a tool, a very basic tool that allows me to do that thing. But then, Patrick, it gets very interesting. Then in that research, I find these other tools that do like all this other cool stuff that I mm -hmm. had never even contemplated doing. And the next thing you know, I get overwhelmed. I am not the only one, right? Like, yeah. oh, I should be doing this. Oh, I should be measuring that. You know, and the next thing you know, you're, you're I, I hate to say this, hemorrhaging cash on tools for which you're only using like that much. Yeah. Right? A lot of people do. A lot of people do this. Uh, this is a very common. But how can you not? There's so much new shiny stuff. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of tools I've tested and tried and stuff like this. Uh, I, I think it's a very common, a very common thing we like new shiny things that we're going to give us magic value in return you know like the, there's no pot at the end of the rainbow so let's just remember that so all this new all this new technology rainbow that pop up i guarantee you they'll give you the same result as what you have now there's no ma like i'm saying there's just no ma real magic there the magic is in what you do with it not in in the tool itself but i'm not saying some tools aren't better than others that's not what i'm saying so you need to do your job and do due diligence and picking your tools but once you have a tool set and you start working it i suggest you just stick with it and when some guy comes along and says you should switch tool a to tool b because i'll give you 20 percent more return or whatever it is uh, the only thing i would say is uh, if you fall for this i would test it heavily before you shift out tool a and it seems to me that most of these trials really aren't long enough, like 30 days. I mean, it takes you, I, people, every time I sit down and learn something, I swear to God, it takes me a good solid 20 hours, man hours, to sit down and read. Can I just say something publicly? I would like a Chewbacca mask. Well, I, I know, what do you mean you'd like a Chewbacca mask? Say more. I want a Chewbacca mask. This woman who's been on Facebook with 100 million uh, views on her Facebook thing because he did Chewbacca, that was, uh, you know, I just think that Cole should give her a store. <laughs> 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 so, you know, so, but just imagine some of the best are some of the best commercials I've seen right now have nothing to do with companies making them. There's this woman with Chewbacca, awesome, right? They come to her house and kiss her ass and give her stuff and all this stuff. There's a commercial for Xbox. If anybody's seen it for Microsoft, with a boy who discusses that he found his father his Xbox in the garage that his father had, and his father passed away, and he started playing the racing game. And he realized that there was a ghost car. So in these racing games, you follow the fastest car. It's a ghost. And that's it was his father. And he would follow this ghost car, which was his father in this game, saying that he believed in ghosts or he believed in the afterlife because he was chasing his dad all the time in this game. Com completely viral on Reddit and everything. And had nothing to do with Microsoft or anything. It was just a commercial someone made. So the best commercials right now are the, the most authentic ones they just come seem to fall out of the sky and, and we love them you know so well you know patrick i think this really goes to what we talked about last week on this blab when i had julie zisman here from uh little bird 
where she what she talked about was this idea of creating a space for a conversation, having topics and spaces of conversation. And that's where the true engagement really comes from. You know? mm. So before before we move ourselves to the after party on Twitter, I wanted to ask you one last question. Yeah. What advice would you give to businesses on how to use social media in a way that's sustainable? What have you learned from your engagement bubble conversation? Uh, this is tough, man, because... I ain't easy. I'm tough. Yeah, no, I, but I don't think that the answer is that straightforward anymore. So uh, I would say that if I would give some advice, I, I would make it... <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know anymore. I'm so confused about the future. You know, so I don't do this for a living. I'm not going to tell people what to do on social media. I can only tell you what I would do. I, you know, I would set up a Twitter account and I would work this Twitter account and I would, and then I would set up a Facebook uh, profile or a Facebook business page and I would drive traffic between these two sites. I would blog. This is, I think, don't blog on LinkedIn. I would not do this. I would not even put my stuff on Medium either. I would create my own blog. And I would write very high quality content and people will find this content if it's of the highest quality. And I would use that as, a, as my mechanism for getting to know in the short term, the people who are going to be my superstars who are going to help make this kind of bloom. I'm loving these comments. I'm <laughs> this is what I think. I don't you know, know, man. I got to say, I love what you're saying because it's exactly what I'm doing. And it's right. it's the advice I give, but I gotta tell you, Patrick, I was looking for this forward to this conversation because I just was not sure. I'm like, oh my god! So that's really awesome, and I love what. So, they, I don't know if you know the guy Scroble. You know the guy. I sure do. Scroble. I used to know him from day one on Twitter. There was a he time when we talked to each other, but yeah, he's a nice guy and everything. But he just started blogging again. He just actually wrote in his blog. He just released a new blog post saying that his biggest mistake, or someone had told his biggest mistake, was giving up his blog. Mm -hmm. And and I think that we need to come full circle of this. I think that if you, the people need to start doing this, and they need to stop spreading their stuff so thin because no one is seeing it. Instead of spreading it thin, make quality content in one spot. Like let's do quality blogging, like Amy is saying, and people will come to you. You start talking to them, and then. Uh, and then it'll grow from there. It's, 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 that's farm work. That's hard work. That's but farm work. That's, that's hard work. I. That's good work. That's exactly so. exactly right. I can't. I couldn't have said it better myself. I love what David says. Customer service. Customers will take care of your social by talking about you. Boom. 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 I think that that's that's outstanding. So I really love this idea of focus. I think that's so important. Um, one of the one of the conversation I got into recently was talked about my philosophy is choose your platform and focus on your platform, right? You know, by the nature of my business, I'm on a variety of things, but there's a platform that I love that my community and customers participate in that happens to be Twitter and all things related to Twitter. And I really like that. Yeah. Um, and this friend of mine said, well, don't you have to be on the platform, let's say, where your customers are or whatever? And I said, I've noticed that LinkedIn has changed its platform to be more like maybe some other platforms because that's what their users want. There are people that love LinkedIn. There are people that love Twitter. There are people that love Facebook. Thoughts? I... Um of course, you should go where your customers are, but I think that's a dangerous game right now because I think your customers are like you. They're kind of a little bit everywhere. And uh, I'm not saying you should set up, put all your eggs in one basket, but right now we have we have content fatigue, you know, and we're out of time in our life. We spend too much time on all these platforms. I would suggest just focus on some areas and create a beacon of light and just attract the attract the, the, the moss will come to you. You don't have to be everywhere. I hate Facebook. I, I mean, I hate the LinkedIn. I that, that, that to me is the the hideous platform from hell. And uh, <laughs> and I, if you ask me, that's a that's a dead man walking platform. This is my personal opinion, you know. Well, and, that's what they were saying about. Um, that's what they were saying about. Um, what's it called? Google. Google Plus. The only thing that's saving Google Plus is that it's SEO. Uh, Google puts it in their searches and it's optimized. So any content you put on Google Plus is actually perfectly SEO optimized. So 
<laughs> you know, that sounds like a lot of less work than having to figure it out for yourself, if you ask me. So I dump it on there any day. So if Google, if Google is search optimizing your stuff on Google Plus, why not just put it there as a side note? Yes, yes, that is a <laughs> killer advice. And with that, I wanna say thank you. We're gonna move the after party over to Twitter, hashtag Visapalooza chat, where I've got more questions for Patrick, where you guys can talk to Patrick some more now that we've got the complex convo out of the way, I want you to join us here. We're off next week because it's Memorial Day. Oh, do you want to say something about your little phones there? This is my, for my last Nokia phone before I bought my iPhone. I'm so proud of it. I'm going to take a picture on this phone of us on, uh, on Blab. See that there? <laughs> I love this phone. It's the best phone ever. Best so. phone ever. There you go. And uh, Oh, yeah. So join us on June 6th, where we're gonna have Kelly Hungerford, who is most awesome from Biz Heroes. So it's gonna be really great hopping over to Twitter. Thank you all for joining us. Head on over to Twitter, hashtag Visapalooza chat. We'll see you in a few. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.